pathology. The leftover evidence of pain has left its mark in the living world and the worlds of the dead. Not too long ago, I explained the leftover remains of a mysterious flu-like illness in the buttressed bones of a long-necked dinosaur, but more have been found throughout all geologic time periods, even epochs. For some reason, giant ground sloths kept falling into holes in the ground and getting big ouchies, which was the least of their worries as they slowly starved to death in their damp, musty underground coffins of calcite and dollar stone. A set of giant ground sloth remains have just been newly described, which tell us another story of how potentially dumb or lacking in luck these elephant-sized, knuckle-walking, sideways-footed behemoths were. Pathologies in the bones of extinct animals left from illness and disease are great for the understanding of the evolution of diseases, as well as how they may have affected some of the largest animals to ever live. But the other type of pathology, physical trauma, tells us more about the ecologies and lives of these ancient beasts. Despite the significance of bone fractures in extinct critters, they remain largely unexplored when compared to other types of paleopathological conditions, like arthritis and other infections. This goes doubly for anything between the dinosaurs and us, the epochs of the Cenozoic that directly led to our modern world. On top of that, even less is known specifically about the paleopathologies of Pleistocene-aged animals from South America, which was basically a land of the lost, as it was isolated from North America for millions of years. Eremotherium is one of, if not the, largest genus of giant ground sloths so far discovered. It is also one of the few Pan-American sloths that first conquered the lands of South America before migrating to Central America and Southern North America during the Great American Faunal Interchange of 2.7 million years ago to present day, when South America unfortunately reconnected with its long-lost North American sibling to the detriment of pretty much all ecosystems involved. They could get up to 6 meters 20 feet in length, so a good 10 to 15 feet, 3 to 4.5 meters when it stood up on its hind legs and tail with a weight of up to 3 tons. They were a rather long-lived genus originating about 5 million years ago, only going extinct about 11,000 years ago, and were discovered in the 1840s. Fernando Barbosa, badass pirate name by the way. Herminio de Araujo Junior, Isadora da Costa, Andre da Araujo, and Edison Oliveira. You know what? Y'all have some of the coolest names I've ever heard. Literally movie star names right there. This fine team published a paper in March of 2022 that describes the remains of an Eremotherium that were uncovered in the Toca das Ancas site, which is a small cave that happens to be one of the most paleontologically rich sites in all of Brazilian quaternary deposits. This cave has produced two complete Eremotherium skeletons, fragments of at least 13 other Eremotheriums, and a bunch of bones from other smaller ground sloth species. The cave opening is a single dry chamber with two entrance holes approximately 4.5 meters 14.7 feet from the floor of the cave. There are currently two hypotheses as to how animals became trapped in the cave. Hypothesis 1 suggests that animals became trapped in the cave as they searched for water while Hypothesis 2 suggests animals stumbled into the entrance of the cave and fell in. The author team specifically investigated three Aromotherium vertebrae that preserved the remains of lesions, most probably a result of falling into the cave. All three vertebrae are from the same individual and show lesions of similar size, location, and appearance. All three are cracks or fractures running through the left side of the center or centrum of the three vertebrae, with one large center fracture hole or puncture looking gouge that spider webs out in a much thinner crack. None of the vertebrae show macroscopic evidence of new bone formation around the fractures. The team made sure to rule out the possibility that these cracks weren't made by environmental conditions like weathering, erosion, or animals. 
The lack of new bone growth on the fractures would suggest that the animal received the fractures and died as a result, received the fractures and died shortly after, or the bones were cracked by nature long after the death of the animal. Upon closer inspection of the cracks, the researchers found that the edges of the cracks were rounded and smooth, rather than sharp, jagged, or rough. This could mean the cracks had begun to heal just a bit before the animal died. Another piece of evidence the team found in the bones was the color of the cracks versus the rest of the bone. If it was cracked environmentally after the death of the animal, then the cracks would be lighter in color than the rest of the bone. The cracks on the vertebrae are identical in color to the rest of the bone. The simplest explanation is therefore that the animal received the cracks while still alive and are strongly indicative specifically of a bone fracture. The bone fractures were classified as type A, A2, and subgroup A2.1 fractures, otherwise known as vertebral body compression, split fractures, and sagittal split fractures, respectively. This diagnosis pretty much means the sloth got hurt by a compressive force to the vertebral column that split the backbones down the middle. This injury is stable. In other words, the animal broke the bones but could still get up and move. It didn't receive any neural damage. Though these kind of fractures wouldn't have caused the sloth immense or debilitating pain, the thing did die with relatively unhealed bones. So something happened to it as a result of whatever caused the fractures. Covering their bases, the team ruled out the fractures as a result of pre-existing disease, as there were no other signs of illness or disease on any of the other bones of the skeleton. They also ruled out repetitive stress as the cause of the injury as this kind of trauma results in hairline fractures, which are absent from the sloth bones. Oddly enough, compression fractures like in the sloth occur in humans that have osteoporosis, infection, tissue growth from cancers, or trauma. As stated earlier though, since there are no signs of illness to the rest of the individual sloth's skeleton, all of these other maladies can be ruled out as the origin of the fractures. As such, the most likely and really the only realistic option for origin of the fractures is a singular and severe traumatic event, like a fall. A fall like one might take if accidentally tumbling down a hole into a cave. A cave in which one's bones are found thousands of years later, among many other animal bones. Yeah, that seems to fit. Did you like that journey we took? We had to go through all the possibilities to get to the answer that was implicit from the get-go. So now we come back to the two hypotheses about how the cave bones got there to begin with. The first hypothesis was that animals went into the cave on purpose, possibly to look for water. This hypothesis is ruled out for the poor fractured ground sloth, as ground sloths were not climbers, and therefore would be less likely to have tried to get into this precarious cave on purpose. Taking everything we've looked at so far into account, the most likely scenario here is that the Eremotherium is just walking around doing sloth things, slipped near the entrance of the cave and took a tumble through the cave entrance, landing on its back and fracturing three of its vertebrae. After this traumatic event, the animal was left stranded in the cave since Eremotherium would have been only tall enough to almost but not quite reach the mouth of the cave. It was trapped. Imagine that, being just big enough to look out of the cave hole and call for help, but no one could come and help you. The sloth would have died of starvation since water would have seeped into the cave any time it rained. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, am I right? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.